Well, this is, uh, I guess, day three or four. I can't remember which. Gorgeous day. But now everything's a panic again because rain's back in the forecast. So Greg is up raking those two fields to the north. And there's probably another 60, 70 bales in there. And I've got another three or four loads to get to the barn this morning. And if we're really, really lucky, we're going to get it all in before the rain starts tonight. If we're not, well, this time of year, you can get away with tatting it out and letting it dry again. So it's no big deal. It's just... You know, you're kind of motivated to try to get it all done. Kind of a farmer thing. So, there's another group right there. And as far as productivity is concerned, this field needs a little bit of lime. So I got three bales an acre. And when the field's right, you can get upwards of seven. So I think this year we're gonna start investing back in this field. See all that strawberry? To this point in time, it doesn't matter to me because I can make enough hay off my, uh, my fields, about 80 acres of them up here, to feed the cows. But if I ever want to get serious, you know, and start selling hay and putting on more cows, I have to start adding some lime and manure and the like to these fields bring them back. When we first moved into this farm, these fields here, they were just all brambles, hardly any grass in them at all. And when we were mowing trails for the motorcycles, because we weren't thinking about farming, what happened was when they grew back in the trails, they grew back grass. So we kind of had a clue that if we mow these intelligently, we might, we might be able to get hay out of them. So we did. We started doing these mowings, you know, the first year or so, too, where right before the weeds would go to head and seed, we'd mow it. The next year we had grass. And then the year after that, we had some beautiful hay. So it took about two, I guess it took three years to the point where we were started getting some productive fields just through mowing, taking natural fields that had gone fallow for oh, probably 15 years and mowed them back to hay fields in two or three years. You know, again, it's one of those against all odds because the uh, expertise said, kill them, plow them up, fit them, reseed them. And yeah, if we had done that, we'd be a lot further along now. But for the last 10 years, we've been getting enough hay to serve our purposes quite handily. And probably as long as I want to do the number of cows I have, I could probably do that. But I want to retire. And which means I want to get these more productive. And I want to go more tractor and dirt farming than livestock, which means I need to bring these fields up to a, a much better condition to do that. Now I can see Greg through the trees. You probably can't, but he's out there uh, raking up that one field that we use to do our shooting videos. This is a little closer look at the rig I used this week to uh, mow, geez, probably 100 acres of hay or more. And this is an old John Deere 3010. And it has some interesting features. It's diesel. It's the layout of that whole series of uh, John Deere's. And it's not the most desired one. The reason being is it doesn't have a lot of horsepower for that size chassis. I'm not sure of all the reasons why, but uh, 
you know, it's a 55 horse, that range, horsepower tractor on a chassis that usually sees 70 to 100 horsepower. Um, I like it, you know. I didn't buy, I didn't, uh, you know, the, the horsepower part of it doesn't matter to me because it has enough horsepower to do what I do. And that's doing a lot of mowing. What I do like about that chassis and all those John Deere's is they're really easy to steer. They're really handy. Uh, good turning radius, low effort power steering. Um, decent traction on the front ends. So it can actually turn on the side hills. It has, you know, a lot of the typical features like brake for each rear tire. So you can uh, brake steer it if you have to. It's got a decent seat. It's got the typical John Deere uh, gear pattern, you know. There's your fuel injection pump. It had a little oil blow out of here. I had to clean that up, you know. I had to rewire the regulator rectifier. Uh, somebody had thought to try to set it up as 12 volt. It's a 24 volt system. So I ended up putting on a new solenoid and doing a variety of other things with it and it works just fine. A um, couple things it has is uh, live PTO and basically that means that when you put the clutch in or have it out of gear that PTO is running independent of the, uh, the, the drive part of the transmission which is really handy. It's got uh, two sets of remote hydraulics which are absolutely required on the hay bind that I use. And this haybine is a New Holland when they were still Ford, model number 492. And it's a significant upgrade over my old 469. This ram right here, which allows, or the hydraulic swing, which has this ram right here, allows the uh, mower to swing out to a mowing position or swing it back into a travel position like I have it right now. Um, but the other thing it gives you is the ability to adjust where that side swing is relative to your tractor. Like if you're on a, on a hillside, sometimes you gotta tuck it in, sometimes you gotta lay it out, you know. The baffle deflects the cut hay as it comes off the rolls. And if you deflect it straight down like where it is right now, you have what is known as a wide swath. If you let that baffle go up, if you bring it up, then what happens is the grass deflects off these shoot-like things right here. And instead of having a wide swath, um, as a result, you have a windrow. And by being able to do that, what happens is uh, sometimes you get lucky and like we did, a lot of times I could make the cut with a wide swath and not have to run a tether on it before I uh, rake it for baling. What that means is the tether sort of turns it over and fluffs it up to let it dry if it's really thick. When you have a windrow, you pretty much have to tether it at least around here every time. But when I cut it with a wide swath with that baffle down, you know, a lot of times I don't have to do that tethering operation, say it's one operation. This one's bent up a little. It's about 500 bucks worth. You know, you find these at the auction for that kind of money. I pulled the rubber off the top roll, left it on the bottom because it was coming off anyway. So, and believe it or not, it works just fine. My neighbor's has got the rubber off of both rolls and he just set the rolls closer together and it still works fine. You know, those are conditioners. That's what they're called. And they're supposed to crush the grass a little bit and help pull it out from that area and spit it out the back, kind of like, uh, you know, kind of blows the grass out the back is what they're supposed to do, plus crushing it up a little bit. And by just running the roll like that, it still works fine. Um, the cutter bar is really what's important on these. And the cutter bar on this is nice and straight. A lot of times what you'll find on these older hay binds is there'll be a curvature because they've been beat so bad on the bottom. And then what happens, it's hard to keep those cutter bars from breaking. They just fatigue. Um, but this one here is nice and straight, which is why we picked it up. 
And, you know, for what we do, I'm sure this, this thing has cut a lot of hay in its past, but it's going to cut a lot more hay in the future. In my eyes, it's got another few years of life in it before I really have to do anything. You know, the drive shaft and all the drive components are pretty tight. Now, you got to keep these things greased up. I mean, these are old agricultural pieces of equipment. And things like this right here, there's no grease fitting on these like the old 469s had. But, you know, I spray a, a lithium grease in there anyway. Try to get a little more life. And I spray a lithium grease on this here as well, that track. Um, you know, it does have grease fittings for this. Right down there is one. So it gets grease every time I use it. And a lot of them are sealed bearings, and I don't like that, but that's what they are. You know, they eventually wear out, and they're pretty easy to change. Um, this right here is how you adjust the distance of the rolls relative to each other. You can crank them up or crank them down. So, obviously, when I got rid of that rubber, I had to crank those rolls closer together, the conditioning rolls. Um, what else about these things? Obviously, when you maintain them, you got to keep grease in these universal joints, the slide joints. But the most important part to make sure you keep me maintained on these old hay binds is that gearbox right there. You got to make sure there's gear oil in that. There's another gearbox in here. Let's see if I can. You got to make sure that that has oil. This has oil. You got to check these, check them frequently because they're old pieces of equipment. And those, those parts will outlast you if you keep oil in them. And last but not least, at the base of the cutter bar, uh, there's a grease fitting that every day I take this thing out. It's right in there. You can probably see it. Every day that gets a lot of grease. Never let that run dry because that oscillator in there really gets stressed quite quite a lot going back and forth because basically what's happening is it's got this arm in a gearbox that wobbles back and forth like this and pulling the cutter bar and it, it's subjected to a fair amount of force. So, but they've upgraded these things, you know, over the years in uh, like this belt. I mean, it's worn, but I'll tell you what, it's a whole lot easier to replace on this machine than it was my other machine, which was virtually impossible because you had to disassemble the whole machine to get to it. So this is the haybine I've been using the last couple of years. It's the one that obsoleted my old 469. And uh, I guess you see these as 489s at some time. This one's, like I said, is a 492. Um, this technology was 1980s, early 1980s is when these guys came out. The whole hay binding concept has been obsoleted by disc binds. Um, some point in time, maybe I'll have to indulge. I'm not particularly interested right now because we get done what we need to get done with this old equipment. And I happen to like this stuff, you know. There's a little bit of a hobby factor here, kind of like old home lights and the Colex. This is good old American iron right here. You know, and that tractor's earlier yet, you know, 60s technology, 70s technology, and that's 80s technology. But it still cuts hay. And we put down a lot of it this last couple of years for an old rig like this. I've got another couple of fields to do this weekend before I put it away for you know the end of the first cutting and we'll do another cutting towards the end of the summer but anyway a little close up on the John Deere 3010 kind of a low horsepower but nice old tractor and that Ford New Holland 492 haybine Let's get up here in the cockpit so you can see how this looks. Yeah, it's got three-point, and that makes things handy. 
This one here has all the fenders and tires are in good shape. But here's your hydraulic levers. This is your draft. It's left one, right one. And here's your gear shift on the John Deere and here's the throttle. And on the John Deere's, you gotta remember to turn that key vertical, otherwise it keeps the system powered up and it'll burn your battery down. And that's how you shut the motor off, is with a pull stop. But in order to start it, you have to use the key and make sure that pull stop is in. Um, this lever right here is for turning on and off the PTO. And the gearbox is kind of interesting. That's in park. And most of the John Deere's of this era are pretty much the same. But what happens is you sort of pull it down into a set. So this is the first set of gears. So that's a forward gear, and then it's, well, and that would be a reverse. And you go to the next set, and that's a forward gear. No, it's not running, but if that would come down to here, that would be a reverse. I have to get the gears moving to do that. And that's kind of handy going forward to reverse. I mean, it's not quite a shuttle, you know? But when you get down here, that's seventh, and that's top gear. It's not a reverse on the bottom. That's, a, that's the top tall road gear. But that's a forward, and that's a reverse. That's a forward, and that's a reverse. So you could almost run it like a shuttle if you're, you're doing a loading operation with this whole thing. So, this old tractor, I enjoy it. I really do. You know, it doesn't have anywhere near the power my 1066 does. It has less than half the horsepower of the 1066. And what I like about it, though, is from up here, you get all kinds of visibility, you know? And when I'm out in the field, this visibility is saved more than a few fawns that are hidden in the grass because I can see them, you know? Even when I'm not looking here at the hay vine, you know, I can see the ground quite clearly, so... Uh, that visibility serves me well, helps me avoid woodchuck holes and all kinds of things. Of course, the only downside is no air conditioning and uh, you're, you're going to get a sunburn. <laughs> but anyway, uh, a little closer look on the old equipment that I'm using to uh, harvest the hay on the farm.